All right. So what do you guys think so far of uh, Bry Forum London? Number 13. How crazy is that? Uh, so my name is Rick Dellinger. Uh, the session I've got laid out today is, is kind of a discussion, uh, getting deep into some of the new stuff with uh, RDP 8 and Remote FX 2. Uh, I tell you, it's been, a, it's been an interesting ride coming along for this. This is my 11th Bry Forum. This is one of my favorite, favorite events to support, favorite events to participate in. Um, and what, second one now in London? The other one was in Chelsea, if I remember right? Something along those lines. All right, so before I get into it too far, I'd like to actually start. Quick question. How many of you have spent some time with Remote FX2, RDP8, Server 2012? Yeah, a little bit, a couple of hands. How many of you have a, a laptop or a tablet with Windows 8 and you've been playing with the touch? All right, a few more, yeah? A few more, yeah? Um, of you, how many of you have actually remoted into a Server 2008 box or an RDP8 box and messed around with the, the touch? Yeah, a little bit? All right. Anybody got any actual like live users that are hitting a deployment? No? All right, all right. That's actually, that's pretty consistent with, uh, I've been asking quite a few people throughout the session so far that same question. And it's a pretty consistent bit of feedback. So as I, as I start off this section, I, I need to position it a little bit. Because, so I've, I've, been a, I've been a consultant in this space and worked in this space for a bloody heck of a long time. Um, and as a consultant, you know, I touched a lot of different projects uh, with a lot of different use cases and requirements and stuff. And I literally, over the years, have not had a single customer that ever actually deployed native TS. Not one. I've had quite a few that actually did some uh, evaluation stuff with it. But quite honestly, most of the time, by the time they called me, they already figured out, well, we're not going to be able to do this, A, without a little bit of help, and B, without some additional technologies. So as I went into this, uh, my perspective, and a lot of the way that you'll, you'll hear me talk about and position some of these things, is coming from a, a very Citrix-heavy perspective. Uh, that's, that's my life. That's where I've, I've lived for a heck of a long time. So about a year ago, uh, my focus and perspective changed a little bit. So I actually sold my consulting company to a cloud service provider. Uh, this cloud service provider does hosted desktops. So my world has shifted a bit in that I've been looking at technology now not to deliver desktops to uh, specific focused internal organizations with a, a broad variety yet focused needs, but been looking at it more uh, from this perspective. So the, the platform and this first product that uh, brought to market underneath my reign, if you want to call that, uh, is a white label platform targeted specifically at ISVs, uh, massive branding end to end. Uh, and one thing, and this actually kind of myths uh, Microsoft a little bit, quite frankly. We've got two different levels of the product. We've got a basic offering and we've got an advanced offering. The advanced offering leverages Citrix. It's quite a bit more expensive than the basic offering. But our uptake of the advanced product is 90 plus percent. And I'm probably being generous and dropping it down into the 90 percent. Uh, overwhelming, once people get into it, uh, they end up stepping up and doing the advanced product because the user experience is just so much better when you're looking at, at 2008 R2 and Windows 7, right? So the challenge, as I went into this session, and part of this came out of some work, uh, Microsoft's really, really interested in the hosted desktop space right now, because it's the fastest growing segment in their hosting business. Uh, so we were doing a bunch of work, uh, and they actually helped fund some uh, efforts that ultimately turned into System Center and Hyper-V3 focused efforts. But anyway, the challenge along this way was, can we take the new technologies with Server 2012, with Remote FX uh, 2 and RDP 8, can we actually build and deliver a premium offering based on that? 
can we deliver something that is a comparable user experience to what we've been delivering with Citrix? So that was the effort, that was the focus uh, going into this. So basically this session, I'm not gonna profess to be a massive expert on RDP8 and remote FX. I've studied a hell of a lot. I've played a hell of a lot. I've had multiple conversations with the product teams, uh, but I will profess I have not done a production deployment of this stuff. So what I'm sharing is my experiences in going through this journey of seeing how far we can end up pushing uh, what's possible with RDP8, remote FX, Server 2012, and Windows 8 on the back end. So with that in mind, here's, here's the agenda. That's kind of what I was gonna walk down through. Uh, and I'm gonna tweak it a little bit as we go. Uh, I don't know, how many of you were in Claudio's session a little bit earlier? A Couple of you? Okay, what about Benny and uh, uh, Nico's session earlier this morning? Okay, cool. How many of you have seen Sean and, and Benny's protocol comparison sessions? Yeah, those are always one of my favorites. So I, I, I also attended those sessions because we didn't have a chance to sync up before. Uh, and there was a little bit of overlap, so I shifted some of my content around, expanded some stuff, and I'm gonna try and, and uh, minimize any of the overlap that we've got there. So anyway, I'm gonna do a, a little bit of a level set on Server 2012 and Remote FX, and then I'm gonna dive more deeply into the protocol and some of the things that they've done. Because there's, there's actually some really, really cool things and innovative things that they're doing with the protocol. Some of the things you're gonna look at and go, um, duh, why didn't you do that 10 years ago? Uh, but there are a couple of elements in there, a couple of uh, very substantial technological advances that I think as they continue to progress are gonna really open up some more possibilities. Uh, then I'm gonna dive in and talk about some of the different connectivity options, how we get into them, how it interacts with Windows 8 and touch and the swiping and stuff like that. I got some demos that I'm gonna do, so I'll kinda of walk you through and show you some of the tidbits. Uh, and you'll see through that some of the ways that I've, I've tweaked the, the user experience to try and get it as, as clean and tight as I could. And then at the end, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up and share with you some of the, the lessons I'd learned along the way and some of the tweaks. Because uh, one of the things that I found out big time was that the docs on this stuff are horrible. You guys experience that as well? They are horrible. So it's actually, it's been uh, on the backs of some people that I'll, I'll call out at the tail end of this session that uh, I've made my way through this and gotten to the point. So anyway, let's go ahead and get rolling. So we've got a bit of an acronym soup here now, and I wanted to throw this up just so you get a little bit of a visual, because I'm gonna use some of these acronyms so I don't have these massive names across all of the slides. So a couple of them I'll call out. RDP obviously is a protocol. It's been around for a long time. What, 98 I think was the first production release of RDP. So you'll hear me say that. Uh, RDC also, the remote desktop client. It used to be the terminal server client. Remember those days? Anybody been around since those days deploying that sucker? So RDC, you're gonna hear me talk about quite a bit. RDB, not so much. Uh, RDB now being the term that they used to, the Microsoft product team uses to reference themselves. So you see that in TechNet blogs and, and things like that where some of the stuff has come out. Connection broker, RD web, I use that quite a bit actually as we go through here. Virtualization host, I'm not gonna touch on at all. Session host, same thing. Some, some just uh, glossing references to the two of those. However, remote effects, I will talk about quite a bit. And you probably have noticed a little bit that Microsoft has changed the way that they're using the term remote effects. So it actually, it, it started out as, uh, uh, it was a very specific reference to some very specific features. But with the release of Server 2012, and the way that they're repositioning the technologies and the products a bit, Remote FX has, it's essentially become to Microsoft what HDX became to Citrix. You guys remember that? And the confusion over, okay, well is it ICA or is it HDX now? Well yeah, it's ICA under the covers, right? That's the protocol. HDX is all the features and elements and components around the protocol. 
So I'm not going to go through a massive history lesson here. There are a couple points I did want to make uh, throughout this. Now, Microsoft has gone through multiple versions uh, of RDP and of the terminal services, uh, remote desktop services, underpinnings for it. They've typically, I'll point out that they're typically aligned with operating system releases. They haven't done anything substantial in an out-of-band release to date. But you'll notice as you kind of work your way down, I threw up some of the key little features, you know, kind of the headlining features that they've released along the way. But a couple of things that you'll see here. One, if you look at when they released version 6.1, right around the time that they made that release, they also acquired a company called Callista Technologies. Uh, Callista had some pretty interesting stuff that they were doing uh, with some GPU virtualization. Uh, and there was a lot of speculation as to what the heck they were going to do with it. Let's put it that way. So then as we got up into uh, the release of 2008, R2 and Windows 7, didn't see anything come out of that Callista acquisition. Everyone's wondering what the heck was up. Well, as soon as Service Pack 1 hit, that's when we saw the first release of Remote FX. And you'll see with this new release, it's really, Remote FX has transformed quite a bit. They've really started to uh, give it its legs, if you will. But the other thing I want to point out about this chart is if you look at what they've done with it, you can kind of pick out how the importance of the remoting protocols and the remoting subsystems have escalated. So they kind of got their, their foot on the throttle more and more, and they're shifting gears. So RDP is used all over the place now. Uh, and they did some really interesting things underneath the covers with Windows 8 and Server 2012 and the way that they handle remoting uh, that actually are substantial. They really start to turn those two OSs into more cloud-focused operating systems. So we'll pick out a little bit more of that as, as we get into this stuff. So with V1 and the, the remote desktop client 7.1, uh, the first release of remote FX was really all focused around the vGPU, the virtual GPU. So what they were doing is taking the graphics processing unit on in a physical server, running a hypervisor, Hyper-V, uh, 2008 R2, Service Pack 1 specifically, and they were virtualizing that inside of a Windows 7 operating system, using that virtual GPU then to help compress the graphics. The other thing that it did, which was kind of interesting, uh, is that the USB redirection. This was the first time, if I remember right, this was the first time that they actually had more isochronous USB, a general purpose USB redirection feature. And that was also tied to having the vGPU in place. And they also had a new codec that they had released to, uh, with it as well that helped to do more compression of the bitmaps and things along those lines. And it was that codec actually was the, uh, the only thing that you could actually use and take advantage of in RDS, right? a session hosting uh, model versus a VDI or VM-based model. So there are some downsides to this, though. One of the biggest downsides, if you will, is that a physical GPU is required. And I don't know, you, do you guys think it makes sense today to go out and drop six grand on a, you know, like one of these big turbo cards like they are passing around in the last session I was in? <laughs> I mean, I'm not dissing them. They're doing some cool stuff, right? But just in my mind, as I'm thinking about it, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna drop, I don't know, what, say four grand, five grand on a Blade or on a, on a One U. I don't know, I haven't bought any for a while. And then I'm gonna throw a video card in there for six grand that's gonna get in how many additional users? Okay, I could see it fitting for certain use cases. But anyway, don't, don't let me get too far off the base here. I already mentioned that those two features were very closely tied to the vGPU. Since the vGPU was Windows 7 only and it was Hyper-V only, that meant that uh, the only thing that could actually do the USB redirection was a Windows 7 virtual machine, a VDI use case. The other thing, and this, uh, this came of a conversation actually that I had with Benny earlier on, the way that RemoteFX1 function the way it actually helped in the compressing of the display is it, it, it broke down the display when it was looking at 
which pieces were moving and which pieces they needed to update and compress, broke it down into a grid. So there's no differentiation between the content types that were inside of the user's experience. Uh, and as such, remote effects, if you're actually really taking advantage of those features, was really focused on a land-based use case. You know, if you think about remoting a webcam over a generic USB interface across a WAN, uh, it's, it, it's not a pretty sight. So, you know, that's part of the reason I think why not many people have been able to do RDP very successfully to date over a WAN. So when we start to now dip into the RDP 8 and Remote FX2 world, now Microsoft is talking a heck of a lot more about it being f f suitable for WAN-based deployments. So there were a ton of different improvements that they rolled into this. I threw out a list here. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I, I got a few of them highlighted here because I am going to spend some time on those. Uh, so I'm going to come back to the multi-codec, uh, adaptive graphics, progressive rendering, those first half a dozen there. One of the things that's kind of uh, cool and kind of important, if you've done any work with the touch-based devices, with RDP8, Remote FX2, I'm just going to call it uh, Remote FX now. How about that? Instead of doing this little slash thing. So with Remote FX now, they've introduced touch control. And not like uh, a couple of points of touch, you know, just for pinch, but actually full 256 points. Uh, and that increased from the beta. I think the uh, tech preview, I think, was 10, uh, 256 touch points. So it's kind of interesting now. You know, this, this device here, actually, uh, which, by the way, this gave me a great excuse to go out and, and buy myself a touch-based laptop. Uh, this device has really been my first experience into touch with Windows 8. Uh, I didn't go out and I didn't buy one of the Surface devices. Uh, one of my, my uh, colleagues did. I got to play with that a little bit. Got to play with Benny's tablet a while back, and that was kind of the first uh, enlightenment point for touch computing. Anyway, so there was this uh, multi-touch. That was a, a big extension, a big new feature that they threw out there. There are a couple other things that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you here a little bit later on in some demos. They got this uh, new modern UI, a tile world, as Gabe would call it, uh, modern UI-based RDC, uh, the remote desktop app. Uh, they've got a new auto-discover feature that I'm also going to show you and talk about how to get set up. They've got a media redirection API. And if you look at Link, they're out there pitching now Link. As, uh, or RDS as being a supported way to deliver link because of this redirection API. Uh, another big one, and this, this is the one that I would mentioned earlier that uh, really positioned Server 2012 and Windows 8 as the, the first cloud-ready operating systems, uh, is the soft GPU. So they had the vGPU. But going into 2012, into the latest platform, they essentially put a layer above the graphics infrastructure. So you could have two different ways that it could be, the, the UI could be handled, and the OS called both of them the same way. So uh, you could call down to a physical GPU, or you could call down to a soft GPU. And this is, it's there, it's in place even on my laptop here that actually does have some accelerated graphics. Uh, so we'll see that, that uh, imparts some interesting interesting upsides. For example, now we can take advantage in, a, in an RDS, in a session-based world, we can actually take advantage of things like the USB redirection uh, and some of the other compression, the display technologies that I'll talk about here in a second with uh, adaptive graphics and progressive rendering. So they also updated the stack to DirectX 11. Okay, and I don't know if you've, you've caught it or followed, but the UI now with Windows 8 and with Server 2012 is DirectX 11 based. So if you've got uh, the ability to accelerate those, then the UI becomes pretty clean and, and pretty responsive. In my experience, is the, the new UI has stayed pretty responsive relative to some sluggishness in other apps uh, because that's one of the, the display proto not protocols, techniques, Wrong, wrong word for it, but I'll use the word techniques, uh, that they've done a good job. They've focused on optimizing. And I already mentioned that the, the USB redirection is now for everyone. 
So now let's talk a little bit about adaptive graphics. This is where things start to get really, really interesting. So if you remember a little bit ago, I talked about the whole grid, right? With Remote FX1 and RDP71, the way they handled the display was in a, in a grid pattern. So they essentially looked at each of those individual blocks and they made the decision of whether or not to compress with what, what was going on in the, inside of that screen frame. They actually made that decision based on those blocks. So now with RemoteFX2, they've actually got multiple different codecs. Okay, they've been using multiple codecs. Other people have been using multiple codecs. Where's the innovation there? So the innovation here is they, they actually take a look at any given element in the UI, whatever's going on inside of the user interface. And they've got some intense algorithms and some patented techniques that they're using to recognize and break down, be able to identify the different, three different types of content inside of a UI. So they can pick up text, they can pick up images, and uh, they can pick up moving images or video types of content. Regular images use progressive rendering, and I'll talk about and show you that here in a little bit. Although if you guys, how many of you have used Citrix? A good chunk of you? Okay. So we've had speed screen progressive display for a while now, right? All right, so it's pretty close to the same thing. Um, but where things have started to get a little bit more interesting now is with a, a feature set that they're calling media streaming. And if you've followed it uh, with the pre-releases the, as they've talked about this, like back as early as build 2012, they've twisted up the verbiage, the naming references that they've used quite a bit. But essentially what media streaming it's taking, rendering the content, the server side, then compressing. See, Benny, you broke it down fabulous. You had the three steps. What were those three steps? Render to hardware. Compress was one of them. That was the last one. Compress was the last. Yeah, pull up. Capture, thank you. Render, capture, compress. So I don't feel bad not remembering it because you couldn't remember it either. So render, capture, compress. But they're doing this on the back end, right? So the rendering is being done server side. And if you think about having the ability, and in Massive, uh, and I just picked this up earlier today, they can actually pick these changes up at 30 frames per second or 30 changes per second, uh, which is pretty darn impressive. But they take those different changes and changing spaces and they put them through uh, this compression engine and render them, send them down to the client. Now when they pick up video, changing moving images or video content, the encoding mechanism that they're using is based on H.264. So we've got decoding now in a lot of devices in the Windows, uh, Windows stack for that type of, of uh, video. What's the word I'm looking for? It's not uh, technique. Oh well. You know what I'm talking about, hopefully. Anyway, the media streaming works with both the vGPU and also with the soft GPU. So remember I talked about that abstraction layer now up above the output, the video, the display output from a, a Windows instance. Uh, works with both of them. Uh, another interesting thing that I've learned, and, I, and I, I love Bryform, I mentioned that earlier, right? Part of the reason that I love it is I get to spend some time around some wicked freaking smart people. So I actually have learned a lot already in this, con uh, in this last day and a half that I've been here uh, that have helped me expand and give me some more things to share with you today. Uh, but one of those things that I learned is that the vGPU and the soft GPU are actually do better or worse at handling different types of content. Uh, and I, I had assumed because of the way that they're doing the screen detection and then the rendering, compression and rendering, one of the things that they pitch is that it does a lot better job. You know, in the past they had media redirection, where it was doing redirecting Windows Media specifically down for local client rendering. But since they're doing the recognition of the moving image or the video now, they can do a lot better job of handling things like Flash, for example, uh, QuickTime, other types of things. So my assumption there was, okay, cool. So they can detect, they're detecting that movement so they can take anything, even like OpenGL. You know, I assumed it was any kind of movement. So one of the things that they can't handle is OpenGL above 1.1. 1 
Uh, that kind of surprised me. But the other thing that's kind of interesting here is that uh, they actually adjust the experience, the amount of frames that they're sending per second when they're doing this rendering based on some active analysis of the bandwidth and the network conditions that are going on inside the client at any given point in time. So I think we all know somebody that's, that's done something similar to this for quite a while. Uh, the unique thing here is their ability to break those up and break those up and recognize those, those changes so rapidly. Uh, so they still do the media redirection, right? But the media redirection, the only time really that they trigger the media redirection is in what they'd consider a land-based scenario. Because the, the belief is that media redirection actually provides a better user experience when you got a lot of bandwidth. The challenge with that is the way that they calculate a LAN type of scenario. They calculate it all based on latency. So if the latency is above 30 milliseconds, then they'll do the render with soft or hard GPU. If it's below that and it's appropriate content type, then they'll actually do the redirection. So in my mind, that's not, uh, not the most intelligent way to handle it, especially if you have the ability to look at other things underneath the covers, like how much bandwidth is there. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. So progressive rendering. We talked, touched on this for just a minute a little bit earlier on. Uh, Citrix has had this with HDX or ICA for quite a while. Uh, but in their world, and you can't tell here because I actually swiped this from uh, a slide from one of the product managers and I didn't take it in full fidelity. But the basic concept is the same, right? When they've got a still image, they can take that still image, they can drop the quality, they can send a quick frame down, and then they can progressively make it look better. So as you're interacting with a session, it's actually pretty easy to pick out and see that. Uh, and it's not necessarily just an image that you notice it in. I've noticed it in some of the UI elements for different apps and stuff, even like Server Manager, uh, interestingly enough. But they do pick out some things like the text elements. Remember the, the multi-codec, the ability to pick out those, those three different content types. Their goal with that is keeping the text elements. So they render those things, they compress those using a very specific codec that does a good job with text. Deliver those down at full fidelity immediately. So in this example, we'd expect that the word content, the text content in there is gonna be rendered in full fidelity and rendered quickly, even in a more of a limited bandwidth kind of a scenario. So that's definitely a, a positive step forward. We also talk about some improvements in the caching algorithms that they use. And as I got into this, I actually I learned quite a few new things as well. So besides improvements, general improvements in the algorithm, the way they decide what a cache object is and so forth, they bump the cache size up. So there's now a potential to have 100 megs of persistent bitmap cache. The piece that I didn't recognize, because I don't spend that much time, and I've never done a user uh, production user deployment of RDP, is that prior to 8.0, if you had multiple sessions and you had persistent caching enabled, only the first session was lucky enough to get the persistent cache. So it couldn't be shared across multiple sessions on a single device. So that's one of the things that they updated. Now you can, uh, each individual device will have its own cache locally. Uh, they also improved some of the ways that it, it handles the reading for instances like this one where you got a laptop trying to save some battery power. The one downside that I've noticed is the memory consumption goes up quite a bit. So I've seen in, in the, the work that I've done, I've seen instances where mstsc.exe is consumed upwards in over 200 megs per instance. That kind of shocked me. And I hit the, the product manager with that. I said, my assumption is that you're doing that because you're doing in-memory caching versus the disk. And he confirmed, yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay, so how many of you remember this from, uh, I can't remember, I think it might have been the 7.0 RDC. <coughs> Nellie Porter, in fact, I think was at a Bry Forum, Chicago, was it? Where she was showing this and she was talking about yeah, you know, in the old world, you could choose the different things, and then we were actually doing a lot of different optimizations in the background based on those. And she was touting, hey, now with this, you don't have to make those choices because we'll make those choices up front, and we'll set the session up based on what we detect. 
All right, so that's just at session setup. Now what they do is they do that at session setup, but they also do it throughout the session. So they can adapt things like the frame rate for the content that they're using. Even the type of codec that they're using for the different content can be adapted dynamically throughout a given session based on the live network conditions. And if you think about some of the conditions and the variety of networks that we get these days, you know, like I had a GSM card. Yeah, I'm packing two phones because my normal provider doesn't do GSM. Uh, but if you think about the, the latency and the variability in packet drops and things like that that we get out of uh, things like the mobile networks that we, we got access to all over the place these days, that actually becomes a pretty powerful addition. You know, even wireless LANs, uh, if you're able to make those adaptations pretty quickly, uh, in addition to some of the other pieces I'll talk about here in a second, the promise of, of improved user experience and improved usability goes up quite a bit. Another thing that they, they added, and this one I didn't get to dig into nearly as much as uh, I had hoped to be able to get into. But from what I've learned of this, forward error correction, if you think about the way TCP functions, if you got a frame that's dropped uh, or a packet that doesn't arrive in time, right? TCP has a reliability mechanism built in. So it'll actually hold up, it'll queue up the other frames and ask for a retransmission. And after a while, it'll cut the sliding window size in half and it'll keep ratcheting it down until it can get the reliability coming into it. So the way I understand forward error correction is that uh, it functions with TCP, but it's essentially almost like giving it a RAID-ish type of a functionality. So they have the ability to recover from drop packets without queuing, you know, stopping the rest of the TCP communications and doing the TCP adjustments like shrinking down the sliding window size. So that, uh, their pitch there is that that has a pretty substantial impact on the usability on these variable types of networks. Another thing that they've added is the UDP transport. Right, so Citrix did this, what, a year ago? Was it uh, Zen Desktop 5.0 or 5.5? I can't remember, 5? Yeah, so they released UDP, they added uh, UDP. So you'd actually have some TCP, or excuse me, network connections outside of 1494 or 2598. And in this scenario, they were using it to transmit things like audio, right? Uh, the, the idea there being that UDP can handle losses quite a bit better since it doesn't do those, uh, some of those behaviors that TCP does that I'd already kind of touched on. The UDP, uh, UDP also uses the same port, so you don't have to look at opening up an additional port type on internal networks anyway, and we'll find out uh, here in a bit that's not necessarily the case uh, all over the place. So when you're looking at and trying to get a feel for how these protocols function and how they're making the different decisions of how to adapt, take a look at the event logs. And I didn't think of this initially, but if you look at the event logs, they're actually tracking in a lot of detail what's going on, the decisions that they're making. The screenshot that I showed you here, 134 milliseconds, they detected in terms of the, the latency on that session when they set it up. Uh, the other one, the, the line up above it or just below it was the amount of bandwidth that they had detected. So you can get a lot more data out of that if you're trying to understand a little bit more about what's going on with the protocol if you dig into the event logs. They've instrumented it quite a bit better. What they haven't done is like Citrix with HDXmon, where they've actually wrapped a UI up above that uh, and been able to actually give you some usable live data um, presented consistently. So remote effects for WAN, another piece that they've been pitching here. The UDP transport, they're actually leveraging UDP when UDP is possible uh, to send a lot of different types of things. So the H.264 H content, that goes down through. Uh, some of the progressive display stuff, the way they handle the images, that goes down through. Uh, what I found kind of interesting, audio of course, is that they actually did the same thing with the touch commands. So that was a little bit of a head scratcher for me, but hey, cool. 
Uh, and I'd also ask the question, okay, if you don't have the ability to do UDP, you've got an older client or whatever, then what happens? Well, everything just falls back to TCP. They still try and do the same things, but they're just using the TCP protocol versus the UDP protocol. So this really begs the question then, what about public networks? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but well, actually now 99.5% of the users that hit the systems I touch most are coming through a public network. So it begs the question, okay, we're talking about UDP now. We're used to SSL encrypting everything as it goes over public networks, right? So what happens here? Do we do like, like Citrix did and just say, yeah, if you're going through Netscaler or through Secure Gateway, then no UDP for you. Uh, you're done. So UDP actually functions through RD Gateway as well. That had me scratching my head because I'm thinking, okay, wait, UDP? over a public network, unencrypted, and I'm sending things like display information and video? Hold on a second. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Because they, they changed quite a bit in the way that RD Gateway functions in order to be able to support this. So for starters, they changed the way the transport layer works. Up to this point, the, the transport as you've gone through the gateway, uh, and actually I believe for all general connections as well, leverages RPC over HTTP as the general purpose transport. So with this release, they're now using HTTP as the general transport. So the impact this has when you're talking about a gateway, a tunneling of a connection as you come across the public network, is one of the use cases they had supported up to this point was uh, having a stack of RD gateways at the perimeter and doing some load balancing in front of those guys and also not having any affinity defined. So now we got to use session affinity because they actually they have, they have two different TCP streams that are used on that. Uh, one for the upstream, one for the downstream. And those cannot go through two different gateways. So you got to use affinity for that. However, with UDP, it doesn't use 3389, which I'd scratch my head on that for uh, a little bit. It actually uses 3391 externally and then as it comes through the gateway and goes out the other side, it's, it's back to 3389. But the way that they do these setups, the TCP connections have to happen first, but then once those are set up, then they can set up and instantiate the UDP connections. And you see this if you go into the gateway management tool on one of your RD, RD gateways. And I gave you a little bit of a screenshot here. You see we got the two different UDP connections coming through. And then we've got the, the presentation of the one TCP connection. So evidently, the UDP connections, they can go through a totally separate gateway. And the two of them can actually even go through separate gateways. But the way that they're setting these up and what makes it safe to do UDP uh, is they, they leverage an industry standard called DTLS. It's essentially uh, a private handoff of an encryption key and uh, TLS type of encryption on UDP. That was a new one for me. I didn't think that there was any kind of encryption with UDP, but then again, I'm an infrastructure guy, not necessarily a network guy. All right, so now let's, let's uh, we've talked about the protocol quite a bit. Let's start to take a look more uh, at the back end. Let's look at some of the, the connectivity methods and options that we've got. So of course, we've got RDC, remote desktop uh, client. RDC manifests itself in a number of different ways, you know, not just what a lot of us are used to when we're doing administration, you know, start running MSTSC, we're hitting the, the RDC icon. When you get into the later iterations of the client, uh, there's actually also a control panel applet where you can go in and set up your uh, remote app connections and it'll pull in and, and present your remote app and uh, also desktop connections that you've got presented. And of course, you can do the RDP files. I think for any of you that were sitting in Benny and, and Nico's session earlier, we talked about the distribution of RDP and MSI files. So underneath the covers right now, we've got to have an RDP client anywhere. And if we're talking about an RDP client for Microsoft, we're pretty much talking about the Windows platform, right? How many of you run Macs? Yeah, a couple of you. So I haven't tried this yet, but I know at least as of the beginning of 2012, 
the Mac client that actually came from Microsoft didn't support RD Gateway. Anybody know if that's still the case or have they updated it? It is still the case? Yeah, so one of the things that, uh, that my colleagues have come up with, uh, an app for the Mac that actually does support it, uh, is a, an RDP app called Jump Desktop. It's kind of cool, it's got some pretty nice usability features to it, and it supports RD Gateway. What's that? ITAP, another one? Gotcha, cool, so another one. All right, so we've got another way to get connected in and get to launching sessions. That's a web interface like, and that's the, the RD web, and I touched on that a little bit earlier. So, you know, similar to what we've done with Citrix technologies for a long time. Fire up a web browser, point it towards a web page, authenticate, and ta-da, you're presented with your remote apps and also your desktop connections. But we've also got this new thing, this uh, modern UI application. So you'll, you'll see some subtle differences between the two of them. There's, there's definitely some differences in usability between them. But the normal RDC client, when you're running it on Windows 8, uh, it actually populates and, and throws tiles down inside of your uh, modern UI start menu, the, the uh, start page, I guess. Anyway, so we're gonna touch on, we're gonna come back and, and hit those guys here in a bit. And one of the things, and this, this has always confused me, why the heck they did it. And I, I mean, I kind of buy the answer, but I kind of don't, because I know how Citrix has done it, and it just makes sense. So anytime we, we're presenting applications and content, and we've got the ability to define who has ACLs, set ACLs on that content, uh, which I think that was out with 2008 or 08 R2. Anybody remember? When they actually, the remote apps, you could actually set permissions? It was R2? Okay. Anyway, so anytime we're actually doing some ACL sets, we've got to go through an enumeration process, essentially answering the question, hi, I'm so-and-so, what applications do I have access to? And then there's the resolution process. Hey, I'm so-and-so user, you've already told me I have access to this application, where do I go for it? So it's the load balancing decision. Now in the enumeration world, Remember now we've got RDC, and we've also also have uh, RD Web. So both whether we're launching from a browser or whether we're launching from RDC, it's actually leveraging a connection to RD Web, uh, and it's it's essentially like a an RSS feed. It actually goes out, and you'll see here a little bit later what that URL and what that page it ends up calling is. Uh, but the enumeration actually goes directly to the RD web server. Uh, then there's the resolution step. And this is where things, to me, really don't make a heck of a lot of sense because it makes things like single sign-on pretty challenging. And that's one of the things that they're pitching with this new version is that SSO is simplified quite a bit. Uh, you'll see that's not necessarily the case if you're serving unmanaged devices, serving non-Windows devices, or have users that e gad don't use Internet Explorer all the time. Anyway, the way they do it is actually by firing up a stub connection to the uh, connection brokers. So it's an actual RDP connection, fires up, connects to that server, but then they use that stub connection, that's how they get the resolution, which server they go to, out of the connection broker. So we'll see this here in a, in a minute. Um, I'm gonna call it out during the connection process, because with the new client you can actually see as it's going through and it's giving you some of the details of the connection process, you can actually see it connect and then back off in the steps that it's doing and go through them again. So it actually gives you some visual illustration of what that looks like. All right, so enough on this stuff. Let's go ahead and show a little bit of the stuff that we get with the modern UI. Okay, so first, just straight out, right? This is Windows 8, Windows 8 device. It's an Ultrabook, Asus in this case, with a touch screen. So it supports me doing things like, you know, scrolling through it. I can pinch and zoom. Uh, of course, I can touch and minimize and maximize things. But then Windows 8 also has things like you swipe in from the right side to pull out the charms menu. Uh, you swipe out, I believe it's from the left side to task switch. 
No, seriously. Well, I know it works on the touchpad. Um, but then, you know, you can scroll back and forth through the different apps that you've got and so forth. And actually, that's going to really bug me now because I had a bunch of apps showing to actually task switch between. Well, there is a swipe sequence if you can remember and figure out what, uh, what the heck it is uh, that will allow you to do switching of apps. Wow, it's thoroughly annoying. All right, and you see we got hot corners down here as well. Oh, how many of you have run a remote desktop session to a 2012 server and ran it in a window? How freaking annoying and unusable does that become? Okay, I'm gonna go down here and I can hold it down in that perfect spot in the corner and then I'm gonna wait for this start menu thing to pop up. And then I'm gonna move my mouse up there and it's gonna disappear and I'm gonna click on server manager. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've actually, you know, done the, the cursor out to the edge of the window to pull out the charms and went, instead of shutting down the VM, start shutting down my local machine. Anyway, rather annoying. So first use case, let's take a look at, at a non-Windows browser because that's actually a, a supported connection mechanism. So what you're seeing here uh, is RD Web. This is what the UI looks like. Uh, I've got a few apps published here. So you see my individual icons for the different apps that I've got published. And you see this one right here, this is actually a, a published desktop. You know, we, in the Citrix world, we'd have considered a published desktop. We got the foldering mechanism now, you know, so they can finally uh, differentiate and control, sort out which applications go into which windows. But now the experience that I'm gonna get when I go to launch something like my desktop. You see what happened there? I got an RDP file that was downloaded. So the way they support non-Windows clients is by instead of making an ActiveX call, remember Citrix doing that, they'd actually ship an RDP file down. So we got to open that thing up and then once we open it up, it fires our connection up. All right, so if you notice here, if you're watching closely, securing, configuring, establishing connection quality, did you notice it change a couple of times there? I don't know if you were, you were watching quickly enough, but it changes a couple of times there. So you can see that initial connection, which my RDCBs are, are separate boxes in the back for my two RDS servers uh, in this particular lab. Uh, anyway, what you didn't see, and I haven't sorted out exactly why the hell that is, is uh, the sign-on. Normally, the first time through, you actually have to sign on uh, as you go through a non-Windows client. So it doesn't actually do, like Citrix does the ticketing mechanism with the STAs, uh, and pipes it still pipes an ICA file down to instantiate the, uh, the receiver client, uh, but it's not clear text. So they're not doing anything like that. And I'll, I'll show you how they're handling their SSO here in a little bit. But a couple of things about the user experience. You know, they added this, uh, this little lock on there. Uh, that gives me some sort of visual indicator that we're going through a gateway versus a direct connection. You'll also see this, I think, is really cool, this little fidelity meter. Uh, if you hit the fidelity meter, yeah, it gives you a cell phone-like uh, rating. But when you hit that, that's really from the client side, the only clean way, aside from looking at the event logs, that you can tell that UDP is in use. So we're going through a gateway and UDP is in use in this case. So we've also got this little drop down here of the, the charms access. So if you're not talented enough to actually do the right swipes, uh, or you don't have a keyboard to be able to work with, uh, you can actually pull these down and make the similar types of calls, right? So besides that though, I'm now inside of this remote session. If I do things like the swipe, hey, look, I actually got the charms to pop out. It's not quite as pretty. It doesn't do the pass-through, uh, you know, the transparency. However, once you start to pick up on it, I'm finally recognizing and saving myself because when I do it on my local desktop, it's transparent. When I do it in a remote session, it's not transparent. It's black. Ah, visual indicator. Save yourself some headaches, you idiot. 
So we got the start screen. Um, let's see. If I hit all apps, you see I get the, the scrolling back and forth thing. I can back back out of that. I hit the window key, same thing, window key passing through. Um, and my launch experience. Now this is the same version of, of PowerPoint, right? This PowerPoint 2013. So I've got the, the normal controls that I can do inside of here. I've got the multi-touch control. So you know I can do the two finger down and up on my touchpad to control it. I can also do pinch and zoom. So this is the, that same deck uh, that we're, we're looking at right here, uh, just running it on the backside. So you can see it's actually, it's, it's pretty clean as long as you've got some respectable amount of bandwidth. It passes through those commands on some pretty reasonable fidelity. Man, I'd love to remember, learn how to call up that task switching bit. Okay, so notice the title of my connection bar here. That's something I'm gonna come back a little bit later because the, the title of that thing, if you remember what I launched, and I'm gonna go ahead and close out of this thing now. What I launched was this post to desktop here. Now I'm used to, when I launch a connection to a published desktop, I'm used to seeing some sort of visual indicator that tells me what published desktop I'm connecting to, right? So it was a little bit freaky for me to actually take a look and see, oh, it's actually telling me uh, and we'll talk a little bit later, but that's actually the presentation. That's the name of the connection broker farm. So we'll see the, the interesting, uh, interesting challenges that causes here in a little bit. Okay, so let's get out of the Chrome experience. Let's jump into the Internet Explorer experience here. And I'll make sure that I do not, nope, I do not have it running. So it's IE, I've got this particular domain. I've got trusted. I'm gonna go ahead and do the sign in. Now you notice this pop up right here. So what's happening there is the instantiation of the ActiveX control. And I can't remember the name of the darn thing to save my life, you know, it's, you know, the developer name because it's an ActiveX control. But anyway, it's that instantiation of that ActiveX control is the way that they're handling the credentials pass through to a remote session. So now when I launch an application, it's gonna actually do the single sign on so my immediate question when I saw that was, okay, well, wait a minute. You're doing this, you're putting it in memory. Is that not kind of a security hole? And the response I got back was, no, it's not, because it's actually being encrypted with a private key that's only known on the client. Okay, if you say so. Okay, so now I've got the experience. I can go fire up something like Internet Explorer. You notice I see the, uh, the starting, but look at the connecting to dialog again. It's showing me I'm starting Internet Explorer, but it's giving me the connecting to that. Okay, so here's the multimedia experience. And this, by the way, is running in uh, For years, the, uh, the US, so we're going across the pond with it. But you notice if you, if you look kind of close at it, it's a little bit sketchy. You can see the quality level has dropped a little bit. But at least you can tell that they're making an effort to keep the audio and video aligned. And for going across that kind of a connection with the latency, and we could go take a look here in a little while if we have time at the end and see what kind of latency they actually detected in it. That's not horrible. I don't know, how many of you pitch to your users Go out and hit YouTube and watch videos. Go hit msn.com when you're catching up on your morning news and you know, see what the news, newscaster has to say. <coughs> Not too many. Uh, the thing in my mind is users don't necessarily know, understand, or expect there to be a difference. Right? They just see a browser. They just interact with the browser. So in a lot of cases, it's just accidental when they stumble on uh, the multimedia stuff. Now check this out. Notice that black line along the edge there? See that browser window? So that's, that's a, a little bit of an artifact, if you will, of their, the, the way that they're handling their seamless windows. If I go to move it around. So that kind of harkens back 
uh, for me, that kind of goes back to the days. You remember when Citrix first started doing the uh, flash redirection? Sometimes you'd catch it where it had the, the blue screen, you know, that funky fuchsia. No, it's not fuchsia, aqua, whatever. Anyway, kind of reminds me of that a little bit. So now notice, uh, and I think, I think it was Nico or you earlier had pointed out, some of the things that I'm used to seeing now and living in, the, in a Citrix world, things like the shortcuts to my hosted applications. You know, hey, it, it did actually pull down the icon for the app. And let's see if I pull up something like Software Center. Hey, that popped. So I, I get the icon representation down there. I get the overlay of the remote desktop thing. I got that little drop there. Uh, you see in the name, it does pop up, you know, like Citrix does, the Whack Whack Remote. Uh, it shows up the name, but it's not pulling through like I'm used to seeing, pulling through that active display of what that thing looks like. Okay, so that is the web experience. How are we doing time-wise? I lost my stopwatch. 15 minutes left? Okay, I was told I had an hour and 15 minutes, and I got 56 minutes till I hit, when I hit the start button. So I'm gonna take my yeah, time, okay. Okay, so that's the web experience and the launching experience that we've got with web. Oh, and I should note, you know, I, I do still have the ability to interact with touch with these guys too. And that's not so bad right there for a scrolling experience. You know, I can't say that that's, uh, that's heinous by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so now let's take a look at what the native remote desktop client. Now, how many of you have seen in Control Panel have seen that applet that's remote, remote apps and desktops? How many of you have actually used the darn thing? Yeah, a couple of you? Oh, so this little trick, this is what, how, what, how I finally started to figure out how to make this UI usable. When you got a keyboard, window key, I'm used to in a Windows 7 UI, hitting the window key to pop up the start menu, starting to type, and seeing it do the, the intelligent search, the filtering of it. So it does that, it breaks them up into these different categories. So I can type, sort, you see it didn't find anything in apps, it did find something in settings. I arrow down to it, enter on settings, there we go. Now I can actually see uh, what I've got. So in this case, this is unconfigured. I don't, I don't have anything going uh, on this right now. If I was to go take a look at my <coughs> local desktop here, you know, you're not seeing, this is, this is all the apps that I've got on this particular machine. So now I'm gonna go ahead and go through this experience. Now in the past world, users would actually have to remember a URL to plug into here. And the URL would look something like you see there, slash rdweb, slash views, yada, yada, yada. So they've actually done a, uh, I liken it to Exchange, how Exchange does that auto, uh, that's the word I'm looking for, auto, thank you, discover. Uh, language slipped in my head today. So I used one of our backend domains here because it was something that I could actually get set up. But it goes out and it actually does a quick lookup, checks for a specific type of a DNS record, which was actually a stumbling block for me. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But it goes out, looks up that record, and now it finds the URL for me. All right, good to go. I hit next. It's gonna add those. Oh, okay, well now, who the heck are you? So it's got, I still gotta get the, the credentials somehow. Now, I haven't done this experience on a managed device on the back end of an environment, you know, where I've got Kerberos and things like that to work with. So uh, from what I understand, though, in some of the conversations with colleagues and some of the folks like you, uh, it does actually do the pass-through of the credentials, so the user doesn't actually see this step here. That helps if I can type it, huh? So now it's going out and doing kind of like we, we used to seeing with 
in Citrix in program neighborhood, right? It's going out, it's enumerating the, the apps that I've got permissions and access to. Once it's done, it says, hey, okay, you're set up, you're connected, you've got access to a certain amount of apps. And then when a user goes in here, then they see a, a little bit of a summary here. Now, in the program neighborhood world, if you remember, we actually had that refresh value that you could set. Uh, and you could set it so PNA would, at launch time, it would go re-enumerate and pull down new apps. Yeah, so for a user to actually be able to do that, they've got to know to hit properties of that particular connection and come in here and hit update now to figure that out. That's an interesting usability element, if you will. It's almost like I'm acting like there's somebody from Microsoft in the room, which it's possible. What's that, down in the system tray? Actually, thanks for bringing that up. That was something that I was gonna show. Uh, so if I go down to this guy, yeah, got the ability to do disconnect, reconnect, and so forth from here. What I don't have is the ability to see what connections I've got to what servers. That's kind of annoying, especially as an IT guy who's trying to figure out, okay, am I actually getting load balanced uh, across servers and whatnot? Anyway, so I get them there. I get them up on my, my desktop. So now if I zoom in here, uh, you're gonna notice that I've got, uh, if you notice, there's the, the tagline at the end of those, the workspace tagline. So it picked those up, it dropped them on my desktop. Yes. I got to remember how you do it on Windows 8. Oh, as in, no, I don't think so. Because all of these guys are coming up as flat. And like the Office ones, I've definitely have gotten a folder on the back end. What I thought you were asking is whether or not, because you can actually, with the Windows 8 UI, you can build different folders, different views of the start menu. That's what I was, I was thinking that you were asking there. Yeah, or something, some sort of visual differentiation, huh? Okay, so we've seen that. Now, let's go back out to Tile World. And it cracks me up, it's kind of spiteful, I guess, in some ways that they call it Tile World. Anyway, so here's the, the, the happy app. I'm sorry, the modern, the modern UI app uh, for remote desktop. So you notice, okay, it actually does make some differentiation between my desktop connections and between my published applications that I've got going here. I can do a direct connect. I can go down and type a, a computer name to plug in uh, and do a connection there. Uh, when I go to do a launch though, oh, so uh, I kind of cheated on that one. Oh, see, now it actually does the swipe app change. And I don't actually have this app. But notice that it pops up on the desktop. It doesn't pop up as one of the the native applications. So as I task switch, it pops up on the desktop. Okay, time-wise, I think we're getting close. And there's, one, what's that? Try one though, because that is going no. to come up in the UI, in the modern UI rather than the desktop. All right, so I talked about how cool it is to hang out with big brains and learn stuff. One note when you launch it, I'm gonna launch it, because this, this thoroughly freaking annoyed me. Uh, where are you, one note? Oh, you got to install desktop experience. Yeah, so if you go in to server manager and you try and do the add roles, there's no desktop experience there. To install it, you actually have to go out to PowerShell and install the dang thing with server manager. Yeah. I didn't know that. Didn't you? <laughs> I learned that from Claudio a little bit earlier. <laughs> Okay, let me go back here. Uh, presenter view from current. Oh yeah, I hid that slide. All right, talked about connectivity methods, enumeration resolution, did a demo. All right, so let's talk about some of the lessons learned. Uh, first off, branding of RD Web. So you notice a, a little bit of difference here in RD Web. This is, this is before, this is the vanilla RD Web. This is after maybe 20 minutes worth of jacking around. 
So I didn't put a lot of time into this. Um, but you'll notice quite a few differences in here. You see up here, it's already web access. You see down here, I've actually got some sort of branding thrown in. Got some branding elements changed here. Uh, hosted apps and desktops versus remote app and desktop connections. Anyway, to pull that off, uh, if you go take a look on the RD web server, uh, you'll notice there's language specific folders underneath there. And of course, they don't stick it under uh, INET pub www root. Uh, it's actually under Windows web, uh, uh, RD web. Anyway, those ASMX files or ASPX files, if you open those guys up, some developer was actually nice enough to comment the things that we can actually go and localize and modify the text. So the bulk of those files that you see there, let me back that up, uh, the bulk of those files you can actually go in and just poke around and see the different names that they've got on things and tweak them. And so there's a bunch of stuff in there like the change password dialogues when those come up or wrong password or whatever that you can go in and you can kind of tweak. There was another file that Benny was gonna, had pointed out earlier, but he flashed by because he didn't talk about it that he was gonna share, but he didn't. Not that I'm bitter. All right, so there's this other, this other little tweak that you end up doing. If you've got, and this, this, so when I ran into this, it was uh, when our administrator, as soon as I stood this up, everyone's like, oh hey, can I get in that lab? I wanna check it out. Okay, well, you don't have anything published to this other machine. I wanna try an RDP through the gateway to that machine and see what it's like. So if you just do it right out of the box and you're going through a gateway uh, for the RD web, when you do it, you get an error. I can't find the, the server. So the way you fix that, there's actually a property. If you look at the, the page that I'm on there, down into pages, if you look at the application settings, little applet in there, there's this value here, default TS gateway. You gotta set that thing to the address of your TS gateway in order for it to actually, when you type in, the name of a machine to connect to for it to actually find it. There are a couple of other values in there that you could go in and tweak, like optimize experience state uh, is one of them. There's another, I don't know, probably three or four that I found that are self-explanatory and a bunch of other ones that I don't have the faintest clue and no one's been able to enlighten me on them. Another thing, this whole work resources. So you didn't see it much in, in what I did here because I already went and done some, some tweaking on it. Uh, there's another one of those totally not documented to be types of things. So that label work resources shows up in a lot of places. Uh, it shows up on the desktop, at the tail end of the apps, it shows up in the web interface, it shows up in the little uh, bubbles that come up, even shows up in the names of the, the windows that show. So the way you gotta fix that is by setting the workspace name value. All right, so the workspace name is not exposed to the UIs anywhere, right? Uh, and the only way to change it, you know, it's, it's essentially a built-in value. The only way to change it is to actually go in and fire off the PowerShell <laughs> command to change it. So that was, uh, I was the developer that finally came back and told me that. It's like, ah, okay, that's cool, but it's annoying. And another thing that actually surprised me as I got into this is that in order to change it, in fact, in order to make a lot of the changes when you're working on a farm, uh, RDSM is the new management UI, you know, where you go through the, the GUI you, you saw. Uh, at least Claudio showed it, uh, Benny showed it also a little bit earlier. Uh, if all the hosts in your environment are not online, a lot of the actions that you do will fail. So they're actually still setting some values on individual servers, like in the registry on individual servers yet they've got this database. Now why on earth, if you've got the database, wouldn't you set the values in the database, have the servers and you, even the connection brokers store stuff in the registry? So you try and do this and you've got an HA scenario, yeah, it's not gonna fly. Anyway, so once you do change it, then you see like I showed you here. All right, I already, I already uh, pointed out earlier, uh, if you, when you fired up the name that you see in the address bar, and also, the name that you see, if you've got any kind of a, an internal domain name that's different from an external domain name, you end up with a pop-up with a security error. Because the client thinks it's connected to a totally different name here. Uh, and the, the cert that it's being presented with on the back end doesn't match. So it'll throw, uh, in this case, it would throw, uh, this was my lab broker, it would throw that up there. 
So that obviously is a bit of a challenge, causes confusion. I mean, does DEO1 blah, 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 that doesn't mean a darn thing to the user, right? So how do we fix that? Well, we modify the farm name. Okay, easy enough. Modify the farm name. How do I do that? Well, you put it in your broker into HA mode, of course. Seriously, you gotta put it into HA mode so you actually get the database before you can associate uh, the FQDN. You can actually give it an FQDN. Okay, so I went through, I defined uh, set up HA mode. And the name that I put in when I set up HA mode and it gave it in the GUI, next thing, it takes that name regardless of what I put in and it throws it into all caps. I don't know, I, maybe it's a personal thing, but all caps annoys the bloody hell out of me, right? So you gotta do it again. Now, the only way you do it this time around, you gotta go out to PowerShell because it's now read only. It's there in the GUI, but it's read only. So you go out, you hit PowerShell, you make that change, and then it actually pops up and shows you the lowercase. And when you get in, you get connected, then all the places where it shows the connecting do actually show you something that means something to your users and is not thoroughly confusing. Do the auto discover, uh, that's a simple text entry. The place I got hung up on this thing, uh, there's some good blog articles out there. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a call out here uh, to a couple people that helped me out quite a bit on this. Uh, simple text field entry. But some of the public DNS providers out there don't support this. So I went and I looked through three of my test domains that I've got sitting out there and none of those providers would actually support it. They're like, no, that's not a text value. That doesn't follow the, the parameters. Anyway, works great with AD. There's some good instructions in some of the blogs out there on how to do that. But basically, you put that entry in, and then that's how the client goes out, based on the domain name of the user. Uh, pops up, populates it, and gets that connection in. All right, so as I start to wrap this up, I gotta make a couple call outs. Um, See, so, you know, I think I've already made it clear that it's badass getting a chance to hang out with some of the big brains here. Uh, a couple guys in particular, a few guys here in particular, actually. Uh, Sean and Benny always enjoy their knowledge and understanding of the protocols. Those guys have freaking dissected the different protocols inside and out. Uh, so they, they help quite a bit in helping me understand really what's going on, not what the product managers were saying. Freak, he's here somewhere. I, I just finally got a chance to meet him. He's one of the more prolific MVPs on the RDS, uh, excuse, yeah, RDS uh, MVP team. Uh, quite a bit of the little tidbits that I got here were actually from him. I'll also call out Mr. Mike, uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, the, the first tidbits that I learned about Server 2012 and RDS were actually at Bright Forum Chicago last year when you did the session on it. So anyway, he kicked off the initial. So, wrap this up, some closing thoughts. Microsoft's ac accelerating their efforts in this space, right? It's obvious, uh, especially when we look under the covers and we see that little layer of separation they now have uh, with the UI in the app. So their efforts are accelerating quite a bit. It's a huge step forward, RemoteFX and RDP8. You know, it's starting to minimize the whole protocol as a differentiating fe feature, starting to. It's, it's use case base now. However, that great user experience is only on Windows clients. Bummer. So to go back to that, uh, that question that I was seeking to start out with, what do you think the answer that I came up with on this was? Yeah, okay, spoiler, no. Let me qualify that, though. I will say no, not yet, not now. We'll see what happens with, uh, with Blue. Uh, we got some really cool stuff coming up. Uh, we're gonna be hitting the, the TAP program with Blue here pretty hard. All right, at that, I'll thank you guys for your attention, time, participation. Uh, it's an honor to get a chance to hang out with you and present at my 11th, 11th, 11th Bright Forum. Cheers, y'all.